it, man. It's been a while. I got to ask you right off the top, man, these last two years, and I can say two years, how have you been holding up with the way the industry has been? No concerts, COVID, just what we see on social media, news, everything. How you been holding up through all this, man? Uh, I guess uh, pretty good overall, but it, it has been a roller coaster ride, that's for sure. I mean, I'm very fortunate. Uh, you know, myself and family have all been, uh, you know, safe and healthy. And so, you know, that's where I look at things. Uh, I've been lucky. You know, my parents are in town here uh, in Waterloo and been able to help them out and spend time with them. But uh, yeah, I'll admit early on in COVID, uh, you know, the one part time job I was working, I got temporarily laid off. Uh, you know, and with this book, you know, things got shifted. And yeah, I mean, I was a little, uh, went through a brief period uh, where I was kind of struggling. But, uh, you know, from usually from these, these times, you know, you got to try and find the silver linings. And, uh, you know, I used it to my advantage in terms of uh, said, well, you know, I've got all this time, I'm at home, I'm, I'm not, uh, let's try and get busy. You know, I chatted with Bill King recently, and that's kind of the line yeah. he used. And I think it's great. It's very uh, simple. But, uh, you know, I, I ended up uh, uh, needing that extra time, if you will, for this book, uh, which I think made it that much better to get more interviews done, source some more photos. And I also worked on another book, uh, uh, helping a local golfer here in town, uh, kind of write his uh, memoirs. So, uh, you know, overall, pretty good. Uh, yeah, and it's great to hear that too, man. Um, and, you know, as we're talking about things are slowly opening up, um, as we speak, one of the most iconic venues in the world will slowly be opening up with new, I wouldn't say new look, but in a way, new look, new sound, new things, but still tradition is a big part of this, which is part of your book, man. 120 years of this venue, for folks who don't know what we're talking about. What is the book called and what is it about, please? Uh, simply called Massey Hall, and, and that is what it's about. I mean, basically, this uh, historic venue, as you mentioned, in Toronto, that's, uh, you know, been at the corner of, uh, you know, Shooter and Victoria there, um, you know, for over 125, 26 years going on now. And uh, I think that's part of the story uh, that it's remained when so many other uh, venues and historic uh buildings, uh, if you will, across this country, you know, have not uh, survived that long. Uh, you know, unlike Europe, uh, you know, we, we're a pretty young country and we don't have a lot of these old historic buildings that we treasure and keep. And uh, to me, that's part of the great story here that uh, Massey Hall was a gift to the city uh, by Hart Massey, you know, a philanthropist, uh, you know, late in his life that he wanted to give this back. He, he loved music and it was also kind of a uh, uh, meant to be a living memorial to his son, Charles, who had passed away um, at a young age uh, due to typhoid fever. And, you know, it uh, today it keeps on giving, as you said, uh, you know, it's going to reopen uh, in a few weeks now. And uh, I can't wait. Uh, the revitalization has been going on for about three years and everything I've seen and what I've wrote about, uh, it, it should be fantastic. Because like you said, it, it's kind of kept uh, everything that, people love about Massey uh, and just, you know, brought it to a new level. I think that uh, was needed, uh, you know, to, to just uh, improve the things that they could improve and uh, just some of the logistical issues and uh, sound just improve it that much more and uh, seating and other things. So uh, it will be really exciting. I'm sure uh, you and, you know, anyone who listens to this, uh, obviously they love music and to step inside those three red doors again, it's going to be a pretty special uh, night indeed. One second. <clears throat> I wanted to cough and I did want to cough while you were talking. You know, it, it's funny because, um, you know, Massey Hall has been in t TV shows, films. I think in one it was supposed to be, uh, uh, what was that, vampire series or something where it was a, a firehouse. It's you know, it's been in so many different things, but at the same time, it has stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, well, other venues have fallen. Why do you think Massey has stood throughout this time? Uh, well, I think there's several reasons. I mean, one uh, is that uh, it did get uh, 
heritage designation along the way, I think back in the 70s, uh, and that certainly helped. And, uh, you know, it just, I think that spirit uh, that Hart Massey instilled, uh, uh, for some reason, everyone realized that this was a special building. And what I discovered uh, in writing this book, I mean, I chatted with probably close to 100 artists. I mean, I think the artists too, and anyone who's ever played there or stepped foot in there, either as a patron, uh, you know, like you or I just going to see a show or, you know, someone who's actually up on that stage. Uh, it's just such a magical place that no one could, you know, fathom uh, seeing, the, you know, that be left to a wrecking ball. Uh, so, you know, having all those passionate champions, I think over the years too, has certainly helped to, to keep it alive. And I think this most recent revitalization, uh, you know, was the, the, final piece that they really needed to now, you know, I see it will, should hopefully continue for, you know, at least another century uh, to come uh, after, you know, various governments and private donors and everyone uh, have, you know, invested in, into this revitalization that's going to, uh, you know, bring the building up to, uh, you know, modern standards and uh, it adds a lot of new amenities with the additional building at the back, uh, which, correlates to the uh, Massey Hall, Roy Thompson Hall's mandate of artist development, outreach, education. And so they, you know, for example, they have a recording studio in there and they have like a new uh, hundred seat theater so they can have more intimate type shows for maybe the, some of these younger rising stars that aren't ready to play the, the, the main stage yet. So uh, really exciting. And I think it's uh, just a, a good news story for the broader music ecosystem. Uh, as you said, after the last couple of years we've had, and, you know, it's definitely the music industry has been one of the harder hit ones. Definitely. A century and a quarter. How do you research that much time and condense it into a book? And also, as you said, over a hundred artists that you're speaking with, how do you do that to break it down? Because no matter what, somebody's going to say, but you forgot about this and you forgot about that. Yeah, well, that, that is always the challenge as a as a journalist, author, writer. Uh, you always have to make decisions, right? That that's part of your role. And uh, for me, it just begins with I always feel it's more is better at the start. So just you know, research everything and start to uh, find some of those themes, find some interesting stories, uh, little nuggets that maybe uh, you hadn't read before or that might lead you down a, a certain path. Uh, and then that's where a great editor certainly helps. And I've been blessed with, you know, both my books now that uh, I've worked with uh, Alison Hurst. Uh, and she was fantastic from a structural point of view early on uh, to help me kind of reorganize uh, the book kind of chronologically and make other suggestions about breaking different stories out into sidebars and uh, pull quotes and things like uh, so that that's something that certainly helps, too. And uh Really, then it's just about, uh, you know, it's a bit like a puzzle, too, and seeing where the pieces fit in or where there might be a few common themes with stories or, but always, I mean, that's the case. I remember after I wrote my book on the horseshoe, yeah. just like you said, people would go, oh, what did, did you hear the story of this? Or, you know, you didn't include this or, I mean, and that's where I, I joked with the, the horseshoe book. That one, we called it, you know, the legendary horseshoe tavern, a complete history. Well, there's no such thing as a complete <laughs> history because history is ongoing every day, every second, uh, you know, there's new history being made and there's no way you can include everything. So, um, you know, that's bound to happen. Uh, I think for me, it was a uh, wanting to try and capture as much of the diversity of the hall and the, the range of programming uh, that has occurred there over the years, uh, as I could. And I think I, I was, uh, you know, fairly successful in that regard. Uh, but again, it's, that's the thing. Some people might say, oh, there's not enough on the TSO or not enough on, you know, the classical performers. Well, you know, again, that's, you know, decisions that I decide to make along the way that, uh, and uh, that's just, uh, like I said, what you, what you got to do uh, as a, a writer, an author, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, weeding through that stuff and, and also partly thinking, what do you think your readers are going to be most uh, interested in as well? Who are some of the legendary performers that you had a chance to speak with? I'm hoping that, of course, you talked to Gordon Lightfoot. It is the house that he built. And yep. maybe even also uh, one of the members of the Tragically Hip 
because Massey and the hip were so connected together. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was fortunate to talk with Gord early on, uh, and I have a whole chapter dedicated to him because as you mentioned, you know, the house of Gord, he's played there more than 165 times and, uh, he, he slated to open the hall when it uh, finally reopens next November with the, uh, or <laughs> next month, I mean, or, uh, with three nights. So, uh, he, he has a love for the hall, obviously being hometown, uh, Toronto lived, lived here most of his life, uh, adult life. And, uh, so really it's like a hometown show. And yeah, you mentioned the hip. I, I did talk to Gordon Sinclair and same idea. He said they, those were always such special shows for, uh, you know, him and the rest of the band when they, they came and, you know, they did multiple nights and uh, uh, others I talked to, I mean, I, I talked to people like Nana Muscuri, who same thing, it's a, he was an international star that, uh, you know, our generation may not know as much about, but, uh, you know, pretty famous and uh, she's been around for about 50, you know, plus years. And, uh, you know, she's played Massey Hall probably more than any other uh, female artist. Uh, and so, you know, it's pretty impressive. And she talked about just the love of the place and the love of Toronto. And that was the thing that really stood out to me too, is that uh, it's not just Canadians that love this place. I mean, a lot, any of them, you know, people south of the border or international that yeah. uh, you mentioned Massey Hall, or you mentioned, you know, one of their favorite venues in North America, most of them will, will refer to Massey as the place. So. Yeah, no, Stones always loved it, too, when they got in there, too. So, um, <laughs> so many um, amazing things have happened. I could have told you stories that I've seen, and, you know, especially well, that... at Gordon. Like, I'll throw one out there. I remember being invited by Gordon to be at one of his shows, and while he was performing one of his beautiful songs, a fight broke out <laughs> <laughs> during his performance. And to this day, I still laugh about it because a fight broke up yeah. at a Gordon Lightfoot show yeah. at Massey Hall. <laughs> what are the odds of something yeah. like happening like that? You know. Well, well, that's it. You know what? What what would you say was one of your favorite stories in talking to somebody about Massey Hall that's in the book? Yeah, I mean those are always challenging questions, but. Uh... I think probably for me, uh, you know, Basil Donovan from, uh, he's like kind of that uh, low key uh, for, for many that, uh, you know, he hides behind uh, the back of the stage uh, with his bass, uh, you know, keeping rhythm there in Blue Rodeo. But, uh, you know, Baz is such a great storyteller. I, I think, you know, one day he's going to write a book of his own. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it, the one story he shared with me was, you know, when he was, uh, must have been in his early early 20s or thereabouts and he uh he knew king crimson was playing and he, he was a big king king crimson fan this was back i think in the early 70s and uh, he, he decided to go down and try and be a roadie for a day and he ended up uh yeah going out front and he passed himself off as a roadie and went <laughs> and you know he was part of the crew for the day and you know like imagine so he said it was just incredible here he was he even went off and ate with the guys when they took a break like the other roadies and you know he got a pass for the night to watch the show and got to watch them do sound check and so i thought well, you know what a great story i mean uh so that, that's one of them for sure but uh you know that was the other thing there are so many probably i that uh could fill a whole book as you said of just you know fans experiences or artists kind of behind the scenes backstage experiences so you know that was a challenge but uh i think there's enough of them in there enough of those enter entertaining anecdotes i mean some of them had to end up on the the cutting room floor but uh uh overall i i you know i think uh there should be enough in there to uh you know satisfy for sure yeah, you know, yeah, I've uh, I've been blessed not to just be in the audience, but I've been blessed to actually stand on stage with an audience out there. They introduce a uh, band, so it, it is an amazing feeling. You know, you talked about the stories, but there are also photos. What is it like for you? What is it like for you grabbing and getting these photos and trying to figure out which ones are going to the book? What was that like to do? Well, yeah, to be honest, that was uh, almost... Uh a bigger project, if you will, than you know, <laughs> writing the book itself at times, because um, just sourcing the photos, uh, choosing the photos, getting the copyright. Uh, I was so, so fortunate. Most of the photographers uh, knowing that this was a real passion project and, you know, the 
you know, tight budgets and everything in the publishing world. It, it wasn't about, you know, I didn't have lots of money to throw to for a photography budget. Most of them, they were just happy getting their, you know, photos in the book. And I, I was very grateful for that. And uh, so I, I was lucky. I mean, there's a, a lot of it was, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the industry is uh, very close knit and uh, very uh, kind of giving, if you will, too. And, uh, you know, I, I used my network to try and, you know, see who might have photos from the different eras and, and some were harder than others to find. Uh, in terms of the early photos, uh, I was lucky that Massey Hall has pretty good archives and of course. Um, I was able to get uh, a lot of stuff from them and I had, you know, access to their archives from the start and they were uh, great partners and collaborators. So, um, but yeah, for the other ones, uh, it, it was partly just uh, like doing research for a book, right? And following leads and, you know, oh, sending a note out on Facebook at the end is kind of how I ended up getting <laughs> Some of the last photos, hey, I need some uh, Gordon Lightfoot photo from the 1980s or, you know, I, I'm looking for something on Jan Sibbery. Does anyone have something? And, you know, luckily people pointed me to different photographers or that they knew were at a particular show. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm just pleased with how it turned out because it, it really, the photos help tell the story um, for sure. And it's all part of it. What would you say personally is your favorite memory being at Massey Hall? Yeah, I, probably for me, it's, I mean, Neil Young is my favorite artist. I've probably, I've seen him more than anyone else, probably close to 20 times or something over the years. And uh, he played uh, back in 2007, two out of, th I think, three nights uh, on the Chrome Dreams uh, 2 tour. And it was half acoustic, half electric. And yeah, just to see him in that venue. And I, my dad went with me one of the nights. So, you know, that made it extra special. And uh, I think the other night I was front row for the second half. And uh, so pretty amazing. I mean, uh, you know, that. but other than that, seen so many other great shows there. I mean, another one uh, with my father as well. Uh, Jackson Brown was uh, another pretty incredible show because it was just him solo with like 30 acoustic guitars on the stage and uh, a couple pianos and people from the crowd like shouted out requests. You know, so he'd go towards his guitar and then someone would say, oh, doctor, my eyes or something. And, oh, OK, put the guitar down and go play that on the piano. So I think, you know, to be in a, you know, a hall of that 2,500 people and to have that much intimacy where, you know, an artist can listen to the requests and take them and, uh, you know, let them go on that journey with them. I think that that's another thing that shows what a magical room it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of my favorites will always be uh, seeing James Brown perform at Massey oh, yeah. Hall. That was like, wow, George Benson. Um, just, you know, massive fan seeing that. And then um, I remember a surprise performance from the Bare Naked Ladies at uh, at, at this. Uh, uh, it was at Massey Hall, but it was like, you know, a bunch of artists that were performing. And yes, they were supposed to perform, but they were supposed to perform later on. And they basically kind of opened up the show and they made a joke about this is why you come early to a show. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're all like, ah, they're performing now. It was great. Um, you know, there, there's always going to be this, this, um, this beautiful history behind Massey Hall. How do you want Massey Hall to be remembered, not just through this book, but for the next century and the next century? Well, I think, uh, like I touched on briefly, my, my thesis uh, in starting this book was, you know, about it being a place for the people. And uh, that's what Hart Massey wanted. And I, I saw that that theme really has uh, rung true and remained. And I think uh, with the most recent revitalization and uh, Massey Hall's commitment to artist outreach, development, education, and, you know, diversity of programming, uh, you know, that's where I see that uh, the legacy of the hall will continue for the next century and, you know, where the focus should be. It's, it's about creating these experiences for the people and for, you know, a diverse range of people, um, right? It's, it's not, Massey Hall's never been that type of place where, you know, you can't get in the doors unless you're, uh, 
you know, you're from a certain social class or you're wearing a certain type of suit or, you know, it's, it, it, unlike Carnegie Hall, which was built, you know, only a couple of years apart, uh, they share a lot of similarities, but I think you just look at uh, the type of programming Massey has hauled through the years, you know, they've had everything from, you know, opera to wrestling, to boxing, to, you know, speeches, uh, and, every musical genre you can you can name pretty much you know from jazz to blues to folk to rock uh you know it's all all been captured inside those walls so uh to me that's what i just hope uh this pandemic has showed us how much we we need music and need kind of these cultural experiences how much we miss them and i think you know massey uh reopening is such a, a great new story and uh it will just be a place that people can gather uh, for the people for, you know, another century or more to come. Two more questions. One, what do you think about the fact that they did that um, promotion where you can basically buy a seat, get your name put on it? What do you think about that? I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a, a nice way that, uh, A, I mean, I know they're doing it because they still needed to raise some more money probably, uh, but it, in terms of uh, what I just touched on. It's a place for the people uh, and what better way you can have uh, have your own seat that kind of, uh, you know, is there for eternity or at least for the foreseeable future that, uh, you know, you can put your mark, whether it's uh, for a loved one that uh, has passed away or someone that's still around or someone you, uh, uh, and actually, you know, I was very lucky. Uh, it was one of the most special gifts I received for my birthday uh, this past July from my father, who, uh, you know, we've, I dedicated the book to him and uh, we've, because we've spent many memorable nights at Massey together uh, and seen many concerts together over the years. And so he bought a, a pair of seats, uh, one for each of us, uh, I think in the upper gallery somewhere. So I, I think it, that's pretty neat. And then I look forward to going in and actually, you know, seeing, seeing where they are. And uh, uh, it, it was, yeah, like I said, it's a, I think it's a neat, uh, neat touch uh, that they've done. So last question, um, as much as I love Massey Hall and performing there, there's always one thing I always worried about. And I want to know if you touch on it in the book, that is getting the seat with the pole in front of you. Yeah. Do you talk? <laughs> Always in fear of that, no matter what, because you can never remember where yeah. those poles are and you don't want to be yeah. sitting there right in front, have it in all, front of you. Do you ever talk about that in the book? I don't think I talked about it per se specifically, but I do recall like that Neil Young show I mentioned earlier. <laughs> I mean, that That's where my one seat was. It was like... <laughs> In like in the front row, but apparently it said obstructed view. But you know, I, I never felt it was really a huge issue. It all depends where you are. Um, but I, I know for sure with these uh, latest uh, renovations, they tweaked some of the sight lines and things with the uh, when they installed new seats. And uh, the one other uh, cool addition, I don't know if uh, uh, people are aware of, but they uh, they added in uh, retractable seating on the floor. Um, that they can use for select shows. So uh, it allows that uh, flexibility. Um, yeah, Cause I'm sure you, like me, you've been at shows or on the floor and certain shows, you know, beg people to get up and, you know, get uh, lost in the music, you know, uh, shake a tail feather kind of thing. Right. But uh, then you get other people that say, Hey, I'm paying my money, sit down or whatever. So now at least they can sell that whole thing for a particular show that they think would be more, suited for that so i think that that will be pretty uh, a neat addition that you know you got some people think oh you know blasphemy but uh, you know standing room only or uh, general admission at massey but i think it's uh, for certain shows it, it makes sense right i call it evolution things yeah. change all the time david Definitely. congratulations on being able to put this book together man i it's amazon chapter it's everywhere man you got to be so happy about that yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, real labor of love. It's been a long time coming, and uh, yeah, it's hard to believe it's <laughs> finally almost out. But uh, I just, I mean, I couldn't have done it without the support of my family and uh, the support of the Dundurn team and Massey Hall. I mean, they've just uh, all been amazing. So, uh, 
really thankful. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm more excited to, to get back in and uh, yeah. like everyone else and see a show there uh, uh, than anything else. I definitely miss live music. So same here, brother. Congratulations on the book and crossing fingers, man. We running into, we run into each other going <laughs> through the uh, famous red doors, man. Congrats. No, thanks so much, Rudy. It's a pleasure as always chatting.